Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church, and the title of today's message is Pray for the Persecuted. To be persecuted is to be subject to someone's hostility or ill treatment because of your race or political beliefs or religious beliefs, and we're going to focus on that today. Today is Persecuted Church Sunday, where each year Christian churches set aside time to remember and pray for their Christian brothers and sisters who are suffering oppression and mistreatment for one crime, that of being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have had many missionaries over the years that were ministering to these persecuted people tell me that the main assistance that these persecuted people uh, ask for over and over again is our prayers. They ask that we would pray that they would be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what happens. So, Father God, we do want to pray for the persecuted today all over this world all these people who are suffering for one crime, that they are followers of you. We pray that you would pr cause them to be faithful and that you would give them the endurance and the peace and your blessing to, to go through these trials. And we pray for ourselves here in America, Lord, that we would uh, be lifting them up regularly in our prayer time, that we would not forget them and uh, Lord, in that we would appreciate your blessings of freedom of religion that we have here in this country. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. Well, we should all be thanking God every day that we live in a country like America. Where up to this point, we still have freedom of religion. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which we call the Bill of Rights, prevents government from making any laws which regulate an establishment of religion or that would prohibit the free exercise thereof. This is not the case in many parts of the world. Some estimates are as high as 75% of the people in the world are under some type of religious persecution. Who are these countries? Well, there's great persecution in all countries where socialistic communism is in control of the government. This is because Marxist thinking, which is the foundation for those kind of governments, is that there is no God and that the state is the caretaker of the people and really ultimately is the are the people's gods. Uh, places like China, Russia, North Korea, and Cuba, there is no freedom of religion. Even in a country like Venezuela, which once was a republic very similar to the form of government we have in the United States, but was then taken over by force by a socialistic form of government has a provision in the Constitution that provides for freedom of religion, but, and this is a big but, but on the condition that the practice of it does not violate public morality, decency, I've never heard of a religion that causes decency to descend, or public order. This is the big broad brush that they use to, uh, to uh, keep people in line. Recently, some Roman Catholic Church leaders and evangel evangelical Protestant leaders stated that President Nicolas Maduro used an anti-hate law uh, to persecute the clergy. Doesn't that sound ironic? Anti-hate law to persecute clergy. Catholic Church leaders reported that the president had ordered criminal investigations into two of the bishops for violating this anti-hate law after they delivered homilies uh, highlighting hunger of the people and government corruption. Also in Muslim countries where various forms of Sharia law is in place, there is no freedom of religion. 
uh, Muslims who choose to convert to Christianity are often killed even by their own family members to make, maintain the family's honor. This trend is similar but not quite as ext extensive in countries where Hinduism and Buddhism are the main faiths in that country. But Christians are still persecuted and are murdered and their crime again is for accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. The battle for the hearts and minds of men has been going on for thousands of years between the believers of Yahweh God and in others who believe in Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius and Karl Marx. And we're going to look at just one battle in this war and see the sacrifice that is required for God's people to stay faithful in the midst of the persecution. God chronicled these true life events in the Old Testament book of Daniel. We will spend most of our time in the third chapter of the book of Daniel. So as we read now Daniel 3, 1 through 6, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high, as you can see on the slide there, and set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Many believe that the image was the image of King Nebuchadnezzar sitting on his throne, if you can see him there at the bottom of the statue. And he had a large pride problem, and so he put this big statue up there. And uh, by the way, the actual foundations for that statue may have been found recently, uh, where they unearthed the foundation for a massive statue. So the, here it is with the big statue there all erected, and then a herald, a person like a modern-day announcer, loudly proclaims, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the harp, the flute, the horn, the zither, zither, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing fire. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute dictator. So everyone had to do whatever he commanded them to do or they would lose their lives. So, and it, this makes total sense, the slide tells us, therefore, as soon as they heard the sound, all the people, as soon as they heard the sound of all the music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and they worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The world often doesn't care what they worship, if it's good for their well-being and pocketbooks and everybody else is doing it, uh, it's no big deal to them. But God's people, which is us, have a higher calling to a much higher king. And so we're going to go to Deuteronomy just for a moment here and take a look at God's command there, and then we'll get back to the book of Daniel. In Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 9, it says, I am the Lord your God. There is only one God, Yahweh God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He delivers us from our slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And you shall not bow down to them or worship them. So that makes it pretty clear. Among the masses of these different people, there were some Jewish believers who knew that word of God and had been taken to Babylon against their own wills while they were still young teenagers. These young men had a leader whose name was Daniel, the same Daniel whose book in God's holy word, the Bible, that we are reading from today. But Daniel and his companions had made a decision early on. 
that they would serve the Babylonians only if it did not conflict with their faith in the one true God, Yahweh. God greatly blessed them for their decision, and they began to be given unusual authority in the kingdom, especially for people who were originally brought in as slaves. So let's get back to the story in Daniel chapter 3. And here's what it says. At this time, some astrologers came forward and said, You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of God. They came forward, and the Bible tells us they came forward because they were jealous. These young people who were started out as slaves were now given authority, and they were jealous because of the important positions these young men had assumed. And they, so they went on to say, And whosoever does not fall down in worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Well, this blazing furnace was a special kind of extra cruel execution designed to keep the people cowed down to the will of the king. We know that the Babylonians were experts at creating furnaces because they had a, a technique to make large, colorful tiles that were made to cover, cover government's houses and the gates of Babylon. If you ever read about Babylon, you'll see the gates of Babylon. This process was so intricate that it has only begun to be understood in the last decade and using modern scientific instruments. So they knew about furnaces. Verse 12, not on the screen, says, but there are some, some Jews, this, this is these astrologers, they're still talking to the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he gives them their name, who pay no attention to you. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you set up. Well, normally with this king, this would have been the end of the story, but these young men had been given favor uh, with King Nebuchadnezzar by God because of their decisions, so the king had them called in. Well, he's still ticked, but he's in, in uh, the verse here, in verse uh, 13, it says, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned them, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true that you do not serve my gods or, and here's the important part, worship the image of gold I have set up? Well, Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute dictator and he was not accustomed to anyone not following his rules immediately. And he said, you don't, or worship the image of gold that I have set up. It is clear to everyone what the evil king wanted. The same thing that the devil and other evil people want. They want other people to worship them as if they were more than humans. You know, sometimes we call people stars or celebrities or there's royalty. But you know something? They're all just human beings, just like you and I. And so he said, when you, you're not doing that, but when you hear the sound of the horn and pipes and all that, you must fall down and worship the image. And if you do, it'll be very good. And then he goes on the other side. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And here's the challenge that he throws down to Almighty God. Then what God will be able to rescue you from his hand? He is saying, my wrath will be so intense that not even your God will be able to save you. The king thought that he was the supreme power and did not recognize any higher power. So then they replied to the king, Meshach, Reshach, and Abednego, 
O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We don't need to protect ourselves. Uh, we, our choice is clear. They had proven their loyalty to the king up to this point. But now he was requiring them to do something that was contradicting a higher calling they had to serving their almighty God. This now was a bridge too far for them to follow. So as the story goes on, if we are thrown, there, here's Meshach, Reshach, and Abednego, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve, this consciousness of God, is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. It said, they're saying our God is bigger than your fiery furnace, bigger than any power that you have. And they said God is able to, to, to deliver us from it. But I, I love the next verse, 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They're saying even if God in his awesome sovereignty decides not to rescue us, we will continue to remember that he is God and we are not and we'll keep our faith in him no matter what happens. We will serve God even if it costs us our very lives. Well, that didn't go down too good with Nebuchadnezzar. It said, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious and his attitude toward them changed, and he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Each time I read this, I think this is almost funny. Uh, because if you're going to get thrown alive into a burning furnace, I don't know if there's much difference between if it's the regular furnace or it's the seven times hotter furnace, but this was his way of showing his anger. And so in verse 20, he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie them up and throw them into the blazing furnace. So verse 21, not on the screen, I'm going to continue to read. These men wearing their robes were and, and bound up, tied up, were thrown into the blazing furnace. Verse 22, the king's command was so urgent when he got mad, he was mad, and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them into the fire. And so those soldiers were killed just from the flame shooting out of the top of the furnace. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Well, as all of us would and everyone there that day, they would expect these brave men to be consumed by the flames almost instantly, but Yahweh, God, had another plan. Praise his holy name. They hear these guys, they fall into the fire, and they begin to just walk around in the fire like they're walking in the park, unharmed. And all of a sudden, even more miraculously, there appeared a fourth person in the fire. And so we're going to put our slide up here to try to give us some kind of an idea of what this probably looked like. And in Daniel 3, 24 and 25, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar led, leapt to his feet in amazement. Usually kings don't do things like that, but th this was an unusual occurrence. And he asked his advisor, Weren't there three men when we tied, and threw the, threw, uh, tied them up and threw them into the fire? They replied, oh yeah, king, we know there was only three. We only threw three in. He said, look, I see four men walking around in that fire, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Many believe that this was Jesus Christ in the fire with those young men. And you know, we all go through fiery trials at times in our lives. And we need to remember that when we're going through our fiery trials, that we are not alone, that there, Jesus Christ is in the fire with us. Notice this also, the effect from the fire 
is it burned off their bonds, uh, their, their ropes that tied them up, and the fire was there only to purify and not to destroy. And one thing I'll say finally today, if you're in a fiery trial right now, turn your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do, you will look back someday and say, you know what? It was worth finding Jesus Christ. If I had to go through a fiery trial, it was worth it. Well, at this point, Nebuchadnezzar then approaches the opening of the blazing furnace and says, Shadrach, Meshach, servants of the Most High God. Hey, his, his mind's kind of got moved, changed a little bit. Come out. So they came out of the fire. And then it tells us in the next verse 27, And all the satraps, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no f smell of fire on them. What a miraculous uh, thing. Uh, just that they came out alive was miraculous. And now that they would uh, come out, wouldn't even smell from smoke. You know, I love to sit around campfires, but I can tell for a day or two people are looking around, and they, you know, they can smell smoke on me after a day or two. So they, they weren't singed. If you've ever been close to a fire and you got a little of your hair singed, uh, and, and they did not even smell like smoke. And here's what we need to know. That which the enemy had designed to destroy the faith of God's faithful people was now being used by God to produce faith in God's people and all those who witnessed what was happening and all those who would hear of it. Well, then Nebuchadnezzar, he's, he's sure changed his tune. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their own lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is starting to get the picture that he's not the most powerful thing. There's a God in heaven who is so much more powerful. And he re recognized that these young men were willing to, to give up their own lives for God. And that is what we must be willing to do, and that is what people in persecuted countries all over the world is doing. And this is what happens. The church, when it is persecuted, begins to rapidly grow because people see these people who are willing to lay down their lives for the kingdom of God, and they say, what would make people do something like this? And they, they begin to see that these people have something that they do not have. So the... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 29, he goes on to say, I want to tell all the people uh, of every language and, and everyone that the God of Me Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that everyone turns to them. And here's what he said. Here's the key part. For, uh, for no, other, no other God can save the way this God can save this is a pagan king coming out of his own mouth saying, well, does that mean that was the last battle and there's no more battles? Well, we know earlier we said this today. We, we warned that this battle continues, and here's why. In John 15, 18, and 19, Jesus tells us, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. This world is made up uh, under the authority of the devil who is the god of this world and all kinds of ungodly people who do not want to bow their knee to the Lord Jesus. They hate, they hate us. And we, uh, it, it's sad, but that's the truth because we all want to be loved. Nobody wants to be hated. And then it tells us in verse 19, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, as it is, 
You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. These people actually hate God, but they can't resist God face to face, so they attempt to threaten and destroy God's people. I have a little slide here yet that's kind of a sobering look, very quick, at what's going on in the world around us. And this is what it says. Each month, 322 Christians are killed for their faith. Each month, there's people, Christians being killed for their faith. Each month, 214 churches and Christian properties are being destroyed. Each month, this is not a year, this is not a couple years, this is each month. Each month, 772 forms of violence are committed against Christians. And here's what I want us to see, including beatings, abductions, kidnaps, rapes, that's no small thing, arrest, and forced marriage. In Muslim countries, many times young Christian girls are kidnapped and forced to marry their Muslim con uh, abductors. Uh, horrible things like that go on. And so we need to realize that this is all going on. And, uh, you know, in John 15, 20, uh, 22, Jesus said, Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So let's remember that 75% of our brothers and sisters all around the world are suffering this persecution and uh, suffering horribly. And let's just look at one last picture taken when a mob recently was burning down a church, and I think it was in India. This man is not lifting up the cross to lift up the name of Jesus. He's getting ready to throw it into the fire. It represents what they, fa what they hate, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And violence don't always just come uh, to people in other countries. The violence is beginning to increase in America. Uh, in, in 2017, 26 people were killed and 20 were injured when a young man came into a church and began to shoot people uh, without any pity whatsoever. So remember the title of the message, Pray for the Persecuted. Remember we said that persecution is uh, a, a ill treatment because of our religious belief. We need all to be praying fervently for all these people in all these other countries and maybe supporting them in any way we can. And remember what the people want us to pray for and is that, is that they will be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's time for us to pray and help those people. God bless you, and may the Lord bless you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.